Got it? Uh, so, uh, yes. Is that, hello, welcome to the uh, fourth seminar in our Active Matters CMSA seminar series. So, uh, today we're delighted to have uh, Louis Fan. He's visiting CMSA from Indiana, and today he's going to be on uh, stochastic PD arising from expanding populations. And then, uh, so, uh, so whenever like the Zoom, so whenever you know, have questions, feel free to ask. If you're in the Zoom audience, you could either type it or just unmute yourself and just ask. And nice or not, whatever you prefer. And then just and if people inside of them have questions, we'll try to relay. We'll try to repeat the questions so that the Zoom audience again could hear it. So if you have any questions uh, or concerns, message me as a map on the Zoom. If uh, things are not working, you can't hear or see or anything, and I'll try to take care of it. But, I think that's it. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Take it away. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. It's a great uh, pleasure to attend in person uh, this uh, Active Matters seminar and meet with you, active, amazing people and uh, people in, uh, joining in the Zoom. Thanks for uh, being with me this afternoon. So, uh, my talk, I, I changed the title a little bit. Apology for that. Um, uh, so it's about stochastic PD arising from expanding population. So I want to give some biological motivations at the beginning before going to the math. Um, so, so let's start with some motivation. Basically, it's motivated by spatial population genetic problems, where we want to understand the dynamics and genealogies of uh, expanding populations, which is which are quite uh, ubiquitous in uh, species and biological systems. Let me show some picture first. The first one um, to illustrate this uh, expanding population is this randomly growing cancer tumor. If you see it in several diameter, uh, uh, in uh, several centimeter in diameter, maybe there are already billions of cancer cells with, with different mutational types. Uh, and if there's no treatment, then typically it's growing randomly uh, in different shapes. Um, and as you mentioned, that uh, we want to understand the gene, the uh, genetic uh, heterogeneity in order to apply the correct uh, drug uh, uh, device, the correct therapy. So it's important to understand its uh, mutational types. The second example people know is this virus spread. So maybe let me talk about this first row here. Uh, on the top left corner, this panel is uh, a petri dish. Sitting on it is millions of susceptible cells. And then at time zero, we initiate a virus infection in the middle. And then that infected cell will uh, uh, infect its neighboring cells. And over time, the total population of infected cells shown in red color here, this because of this red fluorescent protein, will increase. And we see this plague uh, increasing as we move along to the right figure. And then uh, in the second or the third, let's say the third row here, we co-infect the middle cell with uh, this red or wild virus together with another type of virus, maybe it's mutant. Uh, and here is the so-called effective interfering particles. Then this red and the green uh, co-infection uh, will spread at, you can see it might be a different rate and also the spatial pattern can be different. And uh, we want to understand uh, different things. For example, we want to do inference, right? We want to look at uh, maybe a current uh, figure and then try to understand, okay, where and uh, where does the origin of expansion? And we also want, want to make predictions of what happens in the next um, few hours, for example. Virus spread can also be uh, performed on network structures. So, so here is, uh, instead of a petri dish, now the container of the cell is this kind of micro channel where the cells are situated in this micro pattern of different graphical structure. And then uh, uh, virus in, in infections are systematically initiated and observed. This is John Yin at the University of Wisconsin? Yes, exactly, that's him. He's great. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah, he's, he's great. And uh, yeah, we're looking at this type of system recently sure. uh, on uh, two color model, this effective interfering particles. Um, and we see different uh, spatial pattern and fluctuations near the front. And uh, we're looking at uh, um, 
how to sort of predict and uh, make predictions and inference uh, for this kind of system for different network structures, uh, basically to understand the uh, effect of the underlying metric space on virus infection. I will talk a little bit more about this, but let me show the third example <laughs> in, uh, in a remarkable experimental paper, um, Kalashek, Person, Ramanathan, and Nelson, they, they look at this uh, two populations of um, E. coli where they, uh, with the different uh, fluorescent, uh, uh, I think the strains, right? So you have two colors of this E. coli and then if, so the, the message is that even if initially the two populations are well mixed and then put into maybe an arca plate full of nutrition and let it grow, then we'll, over time we'll see this well-defined sector-like segregation of the two colors with fractal-like boundary. So this, this is very interesting. I think there's no selection here, right? The two color are, are the same uh, fitness, but um, yeah, this is very interesting. And so in, in, in these examples, I just want to show you some, some uh, motivation of, stu of uh, studying these expanding populations. And so we want to understand the general principles governing the dynamics and the genealogy, genealogies of these uh, populations. So the approach here, it's also sort of the power and also the limitation of mathematics is that we, we want to study general principle. You can see the word general principle and that might be able to uh, help us understand a large class of systems, but it also has the limitation that it's not specific enough for any particular system because it, uh, we're hiding all the details. But yeah, so let me, let me, so in the next section, I will show, sorry, hmm, it's not working. <laughs> I will show a, an, a particular example to illustrate uh, a expanding populations. So let me, sorry, it's not going to the next slide. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now it works. Apology for the hiccup. So in the next session, I'm going to show uh, talk about a simple example to illustrate uh, uh, different modeling approaches for expanding populations. And the key message is that uh, we have different modeling approaches, like the deterministic approach using for example, PDE, partial differential equation. And here, in this case, I will use the FKPP equation, which is a PDE, to model an expanding uh, wave front. And then an individual-based model, which uh, is, a, is a stochastic model, uh, namely called the, the bias for the model or a spatial Moran process uh, to model uh, expanding populations. So might be PDE is more familiar to the audience here. So let me start with to talk about the PD, the FKPP, and then go to the bias for the model next. So we know that PD is a, is a powerful tool to, to capture uh, space-time organized structures and has been used by mathematicians and scientists for uh, uh, to model different phenomena. Uh, it, for example, the heat equation models the space-time evolution of temperature. And also it can also mod model Space time evolution of uh, a spreading uh, substance. So, this UTX is might be the density or maybe the concentration of a certain substance at time t and location x. So, in the simplest form, the heat equation, this alpha, a constant, is the diffusion uh, coefficient, uh, capturing the sort of the mean square distance of a typical particle. Uh, in the microscopic scale. Now, if we add a, a function f of u to the heat equation, typically the equation becomes nonlinear. Um, and this is a reaction diffusion equation. When f of u is this particular form, beta times u times one minus u, modeling uh, local logistic growth, then this equation is the well-known uh, Fisher-KPP equation, right? 
So the most important prediction of this equation is that it, it captures a formation of traveling wave front. So for step like initial condition, if we plot the solution at a positive time t, now over space, this would be a snapshot of this solution. And if you plot it over a longer time, right, over time, then we will see this wave travel to the right with a certain speed. And for this equation, it is proven by different methods that the asymptotic speed, the minimal asymptotic speed is two times square root alpha beta. So the selective speed is this, where alpha is the diffusion coefficient and beta is the local logistic growth rate. So this is a full wave. Yes. And, 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 no better than I, I think. What is, the, maybe you can say this later, we can talk privately if you wish. Uh, what's known about the push wave? And Good. velocity selection, these, simple, these other these similar questions, but these different wave types. Yes, it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, for push wave, we, we didn't study here. Uh, I know uh, Addison Etheridge and also uh, Sarah Pennington. Yes. They recently, maybe one or two years ago, they look at this uh, push wave okay. um, uh, from uh, uh, um, spatial Moran type models, okay. and they so and they look at the genealogy of that. So okay. so there's some existing work, but uh, yeah, I I don't know much about the push wave. Okay. Maybe we can chat later. Yeah, yeah, but I but but I think a lot of the techniques can be applied to a specific. Uh, so some push wave, for example. Uh, there's one that is uh, when this F, sorry, when this reaction term is replaced by one minus U times one plus a constant times U. Yeah, if that constant yeah. is bigger than two, yeah. then it becomes a push wave. Yeah. And then a lot of the techniques here can be okay. applied. Yeah, we, 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 we yeah, it's a, it's a great, great question. Right, so I should mention that uh, this FKPP type equation, right? Oh, So this function, this nonlinear function, it can be replaced by some other form as long as it has a certain sort of bistable linearity, uh, then uh, the speed will be the same with this beta replaced by the derivative of this nonlinear of this uh, uh, reaction term at look at u equals zero. So, so it has some sort of universality. For pooled wave, <laughs> so uh, of course a two-component system has been studied by people, and then they can capture a uh, different space-time organized structure. But that's not the main point here. The point is uh, this: in the PD approach often assume individuals are infinitesimally small and there's no noise. But we know that uh, in a lot of biological systems, especially when the copy number or the the number of species initially is small then there are a lot of uh, fluctuations or genetic drift. So, so a different modern approach is to take discreteness and stochasticity into account and using some kind of individual based model. And here we focus on a, uh, a class of individual based model called a bias photo model. So may maybe not everybody have heard about it, so let me talk about what is a bias voter model, or maybe what's a voter model. <laughs> it, is, it is a simple mathematical model uh, for opinion propagation. So let's say each of us here is a voter, and we have one of the two opinions, coffee or tea. <laughs> okay. And then uh, our opinion will change over time due to our interactions. So, namely, each person will spread her opinion to one of the chosen nearest neighbor and then replace the opinion of the neighbors by her own opinion. For example, Fazan and I are the nearest neighbor. I'm a coffee person. From time to time, I would tell Fazan, hey, coffee is better than tea. And then Fazan will like coffee more than tea. And then Fazan and, and Grace are nearest neighbor. And then so Fazan may, may also spread his opinion to Grace. Grace and I are not nearest neighbor, so I cannot spread my opinion to you immediately, but over time, my opinion can spread to you. Um, you know, for final population, we know fixation will occur. That means over time, at some point, all of us will, will reach consensus, right? Um, 
but uh, for infinite system, it can, things can be complicated. So, so in order to, to tell you this bias for the model, I need to tell you two things, right? First, who and who are neighbors? Second, how often are we spreading our opinion? Right? So um, as you mentioned, this bias for the model was first introduced by William and, and Berknes uh, as a Cantor-Growth model and, and also studied by mathematicians. Um, so the network structure here is this product space, the one dimensional rescaled lattice, uh, take the product with M individuals. So here each dot is an individual and each individual can have one of the two opinions, uh, the dark, uh, solid color or open, open dot. And the neighbors of each individuals are just the individuals in the next two columns. Okay, so this is the network structure. Now, I'm sorry, M, and, and this is a single M is not the number of opinions here. Uh, good point. No, opinion is just only there are only two opinions. Okay, yes. M is four in this figure. It's a column. It's the oh, it's, it's just a, it's a unit of time basically. It's, 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 it's uh, the number of iterations. It's a dim, so-called dim size. Oh, it's a deep size. Yes, M is a deep size. I should know this. Right. Thanks. That's it. You mentioned. Yeah, so in this figure, every uh, deem, so the deem is right. has four individuals sitting on it. So M is four in this figure. So, there, you know, there is, as you know better than I again, there can be multiple uh, opinions sometimes. Yes. And multiple, like multiple colors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, we've done range expansions with 10 colors. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. So is there like a simplification perhaps in the large color limit with a one over n expansion or something? Oh. Uh, and then that, has anybody looked at what happens there? Uh, you, you that, okay, so the question is um, if, so now there are only two colors, what if there are more colors, right? And if there are any limit when the number of colors goes infinite? So later I will talk about uh, two colors. Okay, yeah, too. that's <laughs> yeah. already quite challenging. But I just I was, I was speculating that you had 10,000 uh, opinions. Yeah, that maybe the math would simplify. Yes, uh, I think this is related to maybe the infinite allele model, uh, John Bricolino. Okay. And, um, and when there are uh, infinite number of colors, and we can probably look at the empirical distribution of you know the fraction of each, okay. each type of color. Um, yeah, so I believe there are some uh, some general model that can handle this. We can look at this um, viewpoint. There's a lot of measure value uh, diffusions. Uh, Tom Kurtz and um, yeah, Alison Etheridge, they, they look at this diffusion approximation the, uh, um, of infinite allele models where yeah. they obtain you know, measure value uh, diffusions as limits. So, so I think there's some work done in that direction. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So, yes. Is there a connection with the uh, particle we spin up and down in, in the lattice or spin case? And this the kind of kind of model where the opinion you have to work can interact and it might change spin up and spin down. And then your question about what's the tone count about who has spin up or spin down in this type of model? Yeah. I'm just kind of confusing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great an analogy. So, so Matthias was asking, is there any analogy, right? Or yeah. uh, uh, with the maybe IC model, right? Where you look at spin up, spin down, right? There's two types or maybe more types. And then uh, now the particles are interacting according to some Hamiltonian, yeah. right? So next yeah, maybe nearest neighbor, yeah, then they, yeah. they will be more likely to synchronize. Uh, and then we look at the sort of the empirical distribution of of those of the type one or, or one of the uh, spin type, right? So this is exactly the, the the kind of idea in physics. Probably want to look at mean field, right? The first step, look at mean field limit, right? And they right, that's how they obtain the critical transition for the uh, temperature, uh, inverse temperature. Um, and here we explicitly look at space, and so. Um, so yeah, it's a similar, it's very analytic, it's, it's very uh, similar. We look at some kind of scaling limits. And here, um, the scaling I would talk about is, uh, is a space-time limit, right? 
right? Is a is a stochastic PD. So uh, we can also look at mean field limit, like everybody just interact with everybody, and then look at uh, what is if, if there's a limit. But yeah, if I could just add a comment, this is a very interesting question about analyzing easing models. If you write down uh, a Glauber model, the standard model of the dynamics of uh, spins, about spin flips and so forth. It, it has some similarities, but this beautiful Lodenbrock model, which I think was discovered by the mathematicians uh, well before, at least some people thought it might be relevant to population genetics, has absorbing states, uh, which we'll probably talk about. So if it's all black or all white, the Glauber model at finding the temperature would allow a spin flip. And that's like a mutation. We're going from black to white, and, and those can happen in biology. They're rare, but they can happen. But the voter model, as I understand it, at least originally, uh, originally conceived, um, doesn't allow those mutations. And in that sense, it's not like a finite temperature model. model. Something, something at zero temperature, um, but it's a, it's a very close analogy. And I, but I don't think there's a Hamiltonian. It doesn't relax to. Uh, uh, even the minus beta and some uh, spin Hamiltonian a long time. Mm -hmm. so, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, that much. Right. So, yeah, this is a, a simple model on a, a particular type of lattice to illustrate sort of expanding front. Uh, okay, so I will also tell you how often are the types interacting, right? So type zero is the open dot, and type one is the solid dot, right? So we assume types each type zero will reproduce at a rate two alpha l squared. Right? Remember, one over l is the lattice spacing here. So this choice is just a diffusive scaling. And each type one, the the solid dot will reproduce at a rate a little higher rate. That's where the bias kicks in, uh, with rate two alpha l squared plus beta. And then the, the new individual got reproduced will replace one of the nearest neighbor chosen at random. Is, is the dynamic clear? So, so, so that's, that's the right. So let me show you a crude simulation of this bias model. <clears throat> okay. Let so, so this is a simulation where we take L to be 10, that means the lattice size is 0 0.1, M is a thousand, that means uh, every column has 1,000 individuals. Uh, one means all the 1,000 persons are type one, zero means all the 1,000 persons are type zero, and uh, 0 0.4 means 400 out of type one, 600 out of type zero. Now, uh, yeah, so this is what we will observe. If the initial wave front is like step a uh, step initial condition, and this red curve is the FKPP we just saw with with the same alpha and beta, and so uh, yeah, so this is what what we observe if we simulate the bias for the model, right? Let me. Okay, so yeah, this is just a recap of what is the bias filter model and the rate that we choose. So as I mentioned, each individual will, uh, of type zero will reproduce at the rate 200 and type one will reproduce at rate 204, a little bit higher. And then the movie we just saw is, you know, is one, one realization. So, so this is a model where you have uh, individuals of type zero and type one, but there's no vacuum state, say there's no it's all it's, yeah you're, you're always filled good point yes it's either zero or one it's always filled okay right and then the uh the, the, the agent based simulation is lagging behind uh the uh, solution of the uh fkkp equation uh FKKP. when we simulate the the bias for the model there's no fkpp right it just it's just a very simple individual based model just the cast simulation right Hassan clock and so, right, but, but, but the red the red curve came from uh, a, a, a uh, right a so PDE that, without noise, right? Yes, exactly. So the PD without noise. So so now it's 
what if we look at the mean field limit, right? So forget the bias. If there's no bias, it's just a heat equation because of the diffusive scale, right? This is uh, two times alpha times L squared, where L is, one over L is the lattice spacing. Right. And then so if there's no bias, then it's just a heat equation. Now, if because of this little bias, um, so there's this local logistic growth of rate beta uh, given by, so this is, there's a uh, two beta here, a little bit of bias. Right, beta I'm just trying to, you probably come to this, I'm just trying to pinpoint the, the effect of the discreteness and the noise. Yes. So I guess you'll get there. Yes, yes, that's that way. Yeah, that's sort of the uh, the the main thing here. That because of the discreteness, um, uh, there will be a uh, so there's a uh, an order of um, basically one over the effective population size uh, as the size or the order of magnitude of the variance. And so, yeah. So as we see. The FKPB equation is not a good approximation. This, this is quite annoying because it takes quite a while to do this simulation and oftentimes we don't know, <laughs> no, we don't know what alpha and beta is a priori. And so we have to do parameter search and then so it would take a long time, right? Even for M equals a thousand. So a typical way, right? Physicists might be, oh, what if we look at SPD, right? And in this case, the order of magnitude uh, of the variance is u times one minus u as expected because the noise comes from the interaction between type one and type zero. Uh, and so the question is, what is this gamma, right? Where does this gamma come from? From the, from the bias of the model, right? Um, but before going down, I, might, I should explain a, a stochastic PD like this, uh, what does it mean? Right, uh, what in by solution? <laughs> Maybe physicists don't care <laughs> or have a way to mention this, but uh, mathematicians do care about what does it mean by solution, right? <laughs> um, so one way to make sense of this <laughs> stochastic FKPP or, or in general as a parabolic type SPD is through this so-called mild uh, uh, formulation uh, through uh, integration with respect to Martingale measures. Uh, so basically we view this SPD, this equation, as uh, the equation below, which is an integral form of the equation. So, so this PT is uh, the so-called transition center group uh, of the Brandon motion. So basically, uh, this little PTXY is, uh, you can see at the bottom, PTXY is just a Gaussian kernel. It is a transition density of the Brandon motion with variance two alpha. And then now we just basically, this is a uh, so-called variation of constant or Duhamel's principle, different names in PDE. We can view this uh, as PDE, right? In terms of this equation, we, uh, we just view the upper equation as a short form of the equation below, which we can make sense of. And we can make sense of it because we can make sense of stochastic integration. We can make sense of it using the blue part here. The blue part here is the integration with respect to space-time white noise, which we can make sense of. <laughs> yeah, this is how we make this equation rigorous. One way to make it rigorous. Can you say again what the operator peaks of P does? Is it, is it an evolution operator? Yeah, or some I should uh, mention this is the center group operator. So let me write this. Pt applied to a function. So it is an operator which maps functions to functions, L2 functions to L2 okay, functions. Good. And this is the integration of little p, t, x, y, the Gaussian. That's Gaussian the Gaussian kernel, the heat, the heat uh, equation kernel. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the one below, right? Nice. M of y, it's just a kernel. And in this yeah. space, we are just in, in R1, but we can, um, okay. so this is the operator. Okay, it comes into, all, it comes into the first two terms. Yes, yes, it comes from all, all terms, all three terms, essentially. Right. But oh, yeah, there's a little p there. It comes from all three. Terms. Yeah, this little p is the uh, okay. Gaussian curve. So, thank you. Okay. So, so, the, oh, so here, maybe I should mention the travel then. So, in one dimension, like we know this little p is the order, right? Um, it's like one over square root t, right? 
first of all, get a constant square root of t and constant, right? In, the, in one dimension. In one dimension, right? right. Okay. And this is look, look, here we need an integration over time. Yeah. So when when in one dimension, integration of one over root t is fine, mm -hmm. but in two dimension, this becomes one over t, right? And that's not fine. No, <laughs> and that's why. Mathematics is even worse than three. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. So, so so far, right. it is still an open problem to make sense of this or well, the stochastic activity equation in dimension yeah. two. Yeah. So if, if you have an idea, well, uh, I know. So we do experiments in dimension two, <laughs> check anything you predict. Right. So I think what people usually do is they they okay, one way to do it is to discretize space, and then now each space has a one dimensional SDE, and then you couple the SDE. So now you can work on any dimension. Right. And, and, and that, discret that discretization, is, again, as you know, is, is a natural thing in biology because cells are discrete. So we, we, mm -hmm. The ultraviolet limit or the short distance limit, even though that might be mathematically challenging, is handled by nature. Uh -huh. By having discrete cells, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's yeah. the long distance stuff that can cause problems as a function of dimensionality. That that's my view a more serious problem. Yeah, yeah, good. that's complicated. Yes. interesting point and that's sort of when we look at this uh, sort of generalizes spd on on graph right <laughs> it's sort of what we're trying to to do we look at not r2 <laughs> we look at any graph that might interpolate r2 <laughs> uh, so yeah that that's a great idea and i would love to to know more about the physics point of view how do they recognize how did they have the quantum field approach? I was feeling so. so if I could comment again, that's another good question. Um, there are people like um, Luca Felitti and John Cardi um, who have done in a sloppy physics way that you would have liked uh, the analog of dimensional regularization oh, okay. for this kind of thing. There's a normalization group way to look at it and systematics and for uh, strange things. Um, yeah. I, I could give anybody reference. They're interested, not that they, they, they understand everything and not that you would be satisfied with their method. But uh, in a kind of dimensional field theory way, they do they, they that. Uh, yeah. That's sort of interesting. How do they, so then they can go move forward to study different things like compute probability of ex extinction. Oh, yeah. And then uh, get I, the I correct think, I, think, I think you can do that. And yeah. uh, you know, with their careless physics methods, I think they, they well. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's very much in the spirit of uh, of QED, for example. It's not the same. Yeah. So yeah, so this is one way to make sense of this equation, and um, there are two other ways uh, at least. But uh, but let me find out some fact. Of, so this is what I said: stochastic activity is well posed. Um, for d equals one. And right, um, as I said, there's no solution theory yet for stochastic FKP for dimension two or above. So now we know in one dimensional case, uh, what is the solution? And if you plot it, we, we see this uh, figure typically. So as I mentioned, this figure is from Duran, Mueller, and Smerker's paper 2003. I just, Take their figures. <laughs> uh, so it is proven that a wave front is formed for the stochastic FKPP. So, um, and what is it? Uh, what is a wave front here for the stochastic? 
there is a, a point here which at which it is exactly zero onward. So this is so-called compact containment property. And, and, and there is also a point here on the left where it is exactly one before. And so the weight, it is a it has a very well-defined wave frame, one and zero. This is in contrast to the deterministic case, because in the deterministic case, for positive time is always strictly between zero and one. Are you asking about the, the, the one and the zero are asymptotic? Or are oh, in, in, the, in the, sorry, in the deterministic, the, right? The yeah, so the question is, is this one and zero uh, asymptotic? Uh, that means it tends to one and tends to zero? Yeah, or are there actual points? So yeah, for the deterministic case, for positive time, is for everywhere, is strictly between zero and one. Oh, okay. It's not one, not zero. But for the stochastic case, there would be a point here, uh, which which is a random point location, uh, before which is is constant one. Here, here I'm assuming the initial condition is a Heaviside function. is is a step function. And um, so this proves so-called contact containment property. And also for the stochastic case, it can go extinct. Uh, well, I should mention that uh, now <laughs> we have to assume there's a positive, uh, a finite volume initially, like a bump function, a bump function, um, which has finite volume. Then there will be, uh, there's a positive probability to go extinct. And it is given by this formula. This can be proven, yeah. Um, by, by uh, a duality method that I, I, I may explain a little bit. So well, that's a very beautiful result. Yeah. And in particular, it's saying if I'm reading the uh, symbols right, that even if you have selective advantage, you could still go extinct. Yes. Because of these number of fluctuations. Yes, yes. I yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So, so looking at the formula for the extinction probability, even if there's a beta, uh, beta positive, Right, um, it's still not. Um, it's still positive. So the <laughs> so even if there's a little advantage, right, as, as David said, but that is positive, there's still a positive probability to go extinct. The survival of the fittest is not strictly correct. <laughs> okay, um, the numbers are small. You can have some great mutation like wings or whatever, and uh, still die out. Right. Right, right. As long as there's a positive gamma. Right. But yeah, when gamma goes to zero, then the extinction probability goes to zero. Okay. Yeah. So gamma is like one over the effective population? Term? Exactly. Yes. So gamma is the noise uh, term. It's, yeah. So yeah, this is a beautiful formula. And uh, we are computing this for, for different uh, uh, geometric structures. Yeah. And so, the, and, and also the third is uh, asymptotic speed of the stochastic FKPP is different. It's, it is shown for small noise. So when gamma is, little, is, small, is small enough, then the asymptotic speed for the stochastic FKPP is slower than the deterministic FKPP by an order of one over log gamma squared. Um, it is conjectured by Brunet de Reda by using a cutoff argument and then it's proved uh, rigorously by Muller, Milik, and Gostar in, in Fisiana's paper. In did, I, did, I, did I understand you correctly that there is no analogous formula for uh, push wave? For so push wave, I don't the know. The velocity, well defined velocity, I, but do you know how the specificity changes that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, for push wave, I think things might be more complicated. Uh, it might depend on what happened in the bow, but. but okay. uh, um, I know Pan Panja have a review on that, um, 2001, maybe, uh, Pan Panja, P-A-N-G-A-J-A. -A. Okay. He has a nice review paper on, okay. on um, with, with stochastic fluctuation. Yeah, with the, so he, he looked at both push rate and, and push wave. He did a survey, it's a survey article. Yeah. I know I, I probably we can, I can find it over there, yeah, but we, yeah, we should talk, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a, so yeah, 
So we'll go back to the bisolar model, right? What, what is the gamma <laughs> that we put in, right? So in the simulation, right, we look at this one and zero. What we're looking at is, is effectively the fraction of type one, right? The number of type one divided by the dim size M. And then we look at this fraction and then this fraction will be random. And uh, if we inter interpolate over space, we build it as a function over space for fixed time. And so the question is, will, will this random fraction converge to some, some uh, uh, continuum quantity, ut, a, a function ut, maybe also a random function, right? As m and l tends to something. So here's the here's the result we have. The first result. Recall the bisolar model with uh, on this product space with these rates. If the ratio l over n converts to gamma, which can be zero or positive, then the the fraction, right, the, the so-called uh, the approximate density that we saw the fraction in the previous slide will converge to a function that solves the stochastic FKVD with that gamma. So it can be deterministic when gamma is zero or stochastic. So here we sort of scrutinize all the scaling uh, ranges for uh, different scaling limits. So, so a, a is B at the bottom are parameters that Oh yeah, so and little n is becoming big, or what, what's happening? Yeah, good point. So here are two examples of the scaling we can take. Okay. So for example, if L is, oh, we can just take any a and b, so that two a bigger than b bigger than a maybe. Yeah, okay, if a is one, b is uh, two. Yeah. Then uh, L is root n, and n is alpha. Uh, root n again, okay, right? Okay, one okay, minus okay, one half okay, is root n, okay. right? So we can take L and m to be both root n, for example, <laughs> and then get all right. Now b is one. Oh no, they have to strictly bigger than. That's so, strictly. So, so it is one and two won't work. Yeah, yeah, one and two won't work. <laughs> so we have to take it. So pick any a and b. So let's find this. Okay. And then plug into here, and then this will go to the deterministic FKPP. <laughs> So the effective gamma there will be zero, which means that the fluctuations don't happen. Yeah, so the idea is when m is growing much faster than l, right? That's uh -huh. it. Right, when m is much bigger than l, then. So m is the mean size, and l is the spatial extent. Exactly, yes. Yeah, now that's very interesting and nice to, nice to know. In practice, I think l, at least on the petri dishes, is much bigger than l. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but it's very nice to know. And you're saying that on different, and then n, n is, little n is just a parameter that lets you make these things big. Exactly. In a certain ratio. Exactly. In a certain way. Exactly. Right. Yes. And uh, as you mentioned, right, effective population size, we think of this so, so um, right, so from the scaling here, yep. gamma is like L over M. And so one over gamma is like m over l. And that's, remember m is the dim size for each column and one over l is the lattice size. So basically it is like the population near the wave front, right? It's like the, 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 the population near the wave front. That's the effective population size. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, but we also look at two colors. <laughs> Here's the two colors comes comes in. So what if the type one has actually two colors or two genotypes, <laughs> right? Uh, and then we look at the joint evolution of it. So forget the selective advantage. Suppose the two colors are neutral, right? The, the colors are neutral. There's no selective advantage. Uh, we just look at this so-called uh, uh, inside dynamics of of a stochastic FKPP wave. Or, or the bias for the model. So typically, we see that after some time near the wave front, there will be only one color left behind. So this is like a fixation near the wave front or decrease in genetic diversity in expanding wave fronts. And this is typical, but we want to quantify what's the probability of 
in in one color versus the other. Uh, so in the bias filter model, we introduce two colors, and they are uh, they don't have a selective advantage. So we call it bias bias filter model with neutral label. So let's say the red is labeled type one, and then the the result is is a joint SPD. So we have a system of SPD. So actually we have, in the first time I, I wrote down the M colors actually. And then Rick Duret says that, let's just keep it simple. Like <laughs> we want to write down uh, just two colors to, 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 to uh, make things more transparent. This could be Democrat, Republican, and undecided. So <laughs> often right. <laughs> Opinionated yeah, yes, totally. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so two colors, and then uh, the label is called the L. So the result is that we got uh, the pair of densities of type one and the label type one converges uh, jointly to this uh, couple SP. And the similar method worked for non neutral label. We can also tune it to be the non neutral and also a multi type system. And potential applications are, we can look at the lineage dynamics, uh, which I explained soon. And also we can use it to at least uh, robustly simulate the probability of a gene surfing, uh, robust against the size of the bias model. So there's a noise associated with each color. That's why you have some. Yeah, I should make sense. Yeah, there are three noises, W0, W1, and W2. Okay, what are they again? Uh, these three are three independent space time white noises. Okay. And then the W0 appear in both equations. So these are like uh, the interaction between, I think, uh, so L, so basically the picture is, yeah, should do And this, uh, so there are three, it is a good observation that there are three independent white noise that sort of tell us where does the noise decompose? How does it, where does it uh, come from? Okay. So this is the wave, the total wave. Now inside it, there is some label. So this is the L, the label. Yeah. And this is U minus. <laughs> and so there's fluctuation between this and this, this and this. Yep. And also this and this. Right. So the three noises. That's where the three noises. They're expected to be the same order of magnitude, the noise strength? Uh, the same gamma occurs in all the same time. gamma, yes, the so same gamma. Because the voter just because of the way you're it's a Moran type model and then that fixes gamma for Yeah. Uh, so, they all come from yeah, the same spatial discretization. Right. Yeah. Right. And the same theme size. Yeah. Same plus there are kind of each other, there's no one Yeah, yeah. So I mean because yeah, the noise here, yeah, the noise here, the wave front sort of don't have substantial overlap. Yeah. We can talk later, but an, an interesting variant is to have uh, red and green that poison each other. Uh, 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 what the uh, right green? So there are toxins. Oh, there, toxins. There are toxic uh, bacteria, toxic yeast. You can make in the lab that secrete poisons. Oh. And they have also uh, a cassette that makes an antidote. So okay. they don't poison themselves, okay. but they poison <laughs> anybody that doesn't have the antidote. Okay. And so if green poisons red and red poisons green, uh -huh. then uh, again, we can talk later, you get something which is analogous to a line tension between red and green. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, that leads, I think, to um, push waves. And anything you could tell us about that, the presence of stochasticity, mm -hmm. number fluctuations, uh, we, I would like to know. Yeah, oh, yeah, I would love to. to so, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So that's. Uh... Across the street, across the street, they make these strains that do this to each other. Oh, okay. So they experiment to do that. Yeah, experimental. Oh, okay. You can also make them uh, uh, be uh, altruistic mm -hmm. and overproduce leucine or tryptophan, and, and then they have to cooperate 
and can't make cryptographic as a friend and they're producing and vice versa, what we call mutualists. That gives you a slightly different reaction to fusion junk as well. Um, again, perspective noise. Yeah, yeah. So, so that must, right. It would be interesting to know if they lead to some kind of, I don't know, cyclic interaction. Well, or you can also get a uh, system of rock paper games going in a petri dish as well. And then uh, you get things that uh, are indeed sick like it, it's almost infinitely rich. And, and, uh, it's great to have results for just two colors and simple uh, Darwinian selective advantage. You don't have to go far before, at least in my experience, uh, there's many, many things that uh, we don't know that are quite relevant. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's great to know because, yeah, at some point we wrote down different sort of generalization of these equations and then some proposal got rejected. Okay, where does this <laughs> system come from? Biologically. So maybe it's just related. Interesting. Uh, so, so in the next slide, <clears throat> Maybe talk about, let me talk about the lineage dynamics because that's interesting. Um, we want to look at, so the, the basic question is as follows. Pick an individual at time t at location x, somewhere here. And you ask, what's the probability that it has an ancestor at location z at time zero? So basically we want to know sort of, if we go backward in time, where will be the ancestor? An interesting idea is uh, mentioned in Hollister and Nelson, where they look at this tracer dynamics. And it basically tells that we can answer this question by looking at um, the joints dynamics. So, so, what, so here's the idea, right? Again, let me re, re, recall the question. What is the probability that an individual at time t location x has an assessor at time zero location z. This question is the same as if we color the individuals at location z or label the image, the population at location z at time zero and let it run forward in time. What is the probability that the individual that you picked is labeled, right? And the answer is label divided by everything. That's L over U. Right. And, and in, in previous, we have an equation for the joint distribution of L and U. So we, we can sort of use that to, to look at this probability. Right. So uh, writing it down, uh, of course, there are some heuristic here because we look at, okay, uh, we have to look at the width of <laughs> here and then let it go to zero. So there are still some heuristic. Uh, argument here, not totally rigorous, but, but we can look at it and, and sort of get a, a guess for the lineage dynamics, which can actually be made rigorous in some case. So, so the joint SPD or a couple of SPD suggest that uh, the, the pre previous probability basically is a Kolmogorov equation, solve this Kolmogorov equation, but there's a noise term here, right? So, so if gamma is zero, so let's say if we take this 2b bigger than 2a bigger than b bigger than a, you know that the scaling, then this will go away, and this is exactly the Kolmogorov forward equation. Uh, oh, sorry, Kolmogorov. Maybe there's a moving friend here in your paper that uh, we don't we don't look at, but but basically we can uh, look at this equation and then deduce what is the backward in time lineage dynamics, and from this we know it's a diffusion with a drift term gradient log u. So it's like a random motion, you know, drift that go this direction. So, um, so we can sort of make it rigorous when gamma is zero. But when gamma is positive, <laughs> this u uh, is rough. It's like one half minus epsilon held a continu continuous in, in space and one quarter minus epsilon continuous in time. And so it doesn't make sense to talk about gradient of log. It's not smooth enough. So, so there are in some cases where we don't know how to make this rigorous. But heuristically, it is interesting. Um, yeah, so 
Yeah, so we're just we started, oh, okay. we started five minutes late. So maybe you could wind up in okay. five yeah. minutes or so. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, I'll try. We can okay. slow you down with all our questions. Sorry. sorry for that. Yeah, sorry. That's very helpful. Okay, okay. You can see there are 61 slides here, but uh, I 61 probably <laughs> divided by five minutes. I... <laughs> but um yeah, so this is uh, sort of uh, I, I think I've mentioned the main stuff here, but um I won't talk about the proof, but I want to just mention there is a difficulty in the proof. You might not believe it, but actually we figured the result very quickly, but then it takes like months to write down the proof. <laughs> yep. Because and, and if you're a physicist, you wouldn't bother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it might be wrong. Right. Yes. Good. And the part that is too tricky is about, I mean, it, not tricky, but the part that is uh, involved is about proving uniqueness. Yes. Because uniqueness can fail. And even in simple equation like this. This is just a, um, a stochastic heat equation with multiplicative noise with this power gamma. But if gamma is, we know if gamma is strictly less than zero or three quarters, then uniqueness fails. And so there are open problems. We don't know the borderline case. And for the stochastic FKBB, there is something we don't know. We don't know if on the space of non-negative function, it is unique or not, we don't know. Um, and so in the next section, probably I will skip, is I want to mention how to get uniqueness using duality. And so duality is an interesting technique. And uh, it, it might have relation to some physics techniques. And there are many notion of dualities. A particular notion of duality I'm talking about here is Two stochastic processes U and X are said to be dual to each other with respect to a function H if this holds. Basically, the expectation of H of U at time zero, X at time T is equal to that function at U at time T, X at time zero. If this holds for all initial condition and all time, we say duality holds between these two stochastic processes. And this is a powerful tool because it, it allows us to study one process using the other. And in our case, we will obtain uniqueness of U, U, of U uh, which is the cast FKP DB equation by existence of another process. I see, okay. And, so U, U of T is the original population uh, fraction right. subject to fluctuation <laughs> and so forth. And there's this dual process that you can find yeah, and that that might be easier to analyze. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's how one also. So in our case, U is the cast of FKPP or the of the joints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then X is a so-called branching coalescing branching motion. Yeah, and uh, so this like the branching coalesce branching is related to the bias coalescing is related to the genetic drift. Yeah, and then with that and with the with this product form function, we have this duality. And then using this, we obtain weak uniqueness. And actually using this, we can obtain the probability of, ex of extinction, the beautiful formula before. But I, I hope you'll be able to come to Max Lorentovich's uh, talk. It will be a group meeting, but so we can get you on the mailing list. He's been looking at branching processes of range expansions, which might be an invasion of the branch uh, pattern of uh, Vessels in the lung with, with, with the branch lung, and then cells are being infected in a branching process in, in a physical uh, medical environment. Uh -huh. So, anyway, you might be interested to yeah. try to keep you in the loop. About yes, that. yes, please. Um, yeah, so this is a, a, a beautiful technique whenever available. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't have time to talk about this duality and how to trace the genealogy. But uh, for the for the couple SPD, we have a, a little bit more complicated dual. It's the order. So the branching coalescing branching motion with an order. And that's the dual. And then with that. Um, duality um, only works in one plus one dimensions? It, it works for, oh, duality uh, for the FKBP works for any graph. Yeah. So it, it can be the product space we talk about, it can be any graph, complete graph. So then particular works. graphs that correspond to higher dimensionality mirror figures or yes, that's also work. So basically this figure I'm I'm simplifying. So this space is is the space, is the underlying network structure. Okay. 
Okay. It can be any, yeah. anything. Yes. So, um, uh, so there are two sections. Maybe I have one, two minutes. Uh, this is some recent work on SPD on graph. We we look at oops, going downward. Uh, describe the population dynamics and genealogies for SPD on graph, and we will talk about what does it mean by an SPD on graph. And in that case, remember we make sense of this equation using stochastic integration with respect to space-time weight mass. And now similar thing work, but now this p is the transition density of a diffusion on a graph. So our understanding of this SPD on graph rely on our understanding of the diffusion on graph, for example, Brownian motion on a graph. So, so a graph could be what some physicists call a beta lattice, where you, you there are no closed loops, but you branch and you branch and you branch. Oh, actually, that would be an example of a graph that you. That's understand. that's one example, but actually, this form formalism is general. I understand. You can have, I understand. Yeah. But the, 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 that, that beta lattice thing becomes particularly interesting. Yeah. Uh huh. Good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we have this SPD limit, and we can analyze. But but maybe let me stop at this. Uh, so if you look at this PD or SPD on the graph, well, one particular question we can answer, right? Let's look at SPD on the tree. We spread this on the tree, and whenever we to lattice, you know, mass gets spread out, and that's, that's what we call beta lattice, but that's Trees were known well before Hans beta. Beta lattice. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, the question is, what is a speed, right? So one funny thing we found, in contrast to FTP on the real line, is that there is a critical growth rate below which we don't see linear wave. So for FTP on the real line, as long as beta is positive, we get a wave, right? But not the case here. We need beta to be bigger than some critical. Otherwise, it got spread out and spread out. So the wave dies out. It dies out, and uh, it's more like diffusion. Yes, it's more like diffusion. Okay. It decays yeah. and uh, yeah. dissipates. Right. Yeah. And so there's a critical growth rate above which we can. It's still not so simple the formula for the speed, but it can be written that in terms of some variational form principle, which is sort of in closed form. <laughs> Okay, what's P? What is P? Oh, uh, P is D. Oh, there it is. Sorry, it's just it's yeah. 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 So, it is certainly less than or equal to square root of beta, and it's equal to square root of beta when D is 2. When D is 2 means it's just a real line. Um, yeah, so this recent result and uh, yeah, some ongoing work here. So we, we still want to understand the genealogy, right? Just one lineage is not enough. We want to look at coalescence time and the tree. But um, let me stop here. So, so the three papers I mentioned briefly is, is in here. And um, yeah, I greatly uh, acknowledge the support of NSF, Renar, and also uh, John Wickley and the CMSA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, are there any other questions from either the oh, thank you for the talk or the same audience? Or... Thanks for being here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Same audience. Great. Thanks again. Yeah. Uh, well, Thank you. Really nice. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks for the Zoom audience too.